this, um, and, then, and then we just get straight into it. Um, so, we have, I'll, I'll do a couple of introdu introductions of the folks that we have speaking today, so a lot of you guys know who we have. Um, so we go straight into the past the mind and then I'll do a few introductions, and then we start off with Sarah from uh, a small company called Samsung. So, does anyone on the front want to introduce themselves? Oh, I know you, but it's there. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, KRS Murthy, and I uh, admire Brian and how well he does his events. I have uh, ex ex expressly told him that I like uh, the way he does, very open, and so on. I um, do purchase and acquisitions. I serve as the chairman of the board at board of directors of companies. I have done uh, lots of conferences. You know, I invite all of you and Jim. And I did, I did a three day global big day uh, AI conference this time. I'm doing a big data conference, global big data conference. A three day AI conference So, maybe just a uh, friend here from Polestar. Uh, recently got on the Gardner Magic Quadrant, so maybe you could introduce yourself and um, just maybe talk briefly to that. Hi, so my name is Benoit Cousin. I'm the head of business development uh, for the US subsidiary of Polestar. We are uh, experts in the, the field of indoor location. We started in 2002. We had our first commercial product in 2008. And uh, as Brian said, we have uh, been listed in the first magic project from Gartner about indoor location platform worldwide that came up this January um, alongside Cisco, Aruba. Uh, and uh, be companies like that. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Donovan Conway. I'm with On Process Technology. Um, we are in the post sales optimization and we're using the IoT to become predictive within the services. And uh, Brian was gracious enough to allow me to leave a white paper over on the front. Uh, where we work with MIT to become uh, predictive in uh, service parts planning. Adam Erickson with Device Authority. We are a Dell Edge X partner, thanks to uh, Jason. And uh, we've also spoken to Brian Kessler from Autodesk uh, previously, and I know Brian from his work at Dapper. So we're uh, pleased to be here trying to screw down the uh, IoT ecosystem. So I just want to introduce you to from Toshiba. He goes to all my meetups and he never introduces himself, so I'm just, just going to make him do it today. All right, so I'm being made to do, uh, introduce myself. I am uh, Chris Lee, I work at Toshiba, and uh, I guess in a few months we'll be uh, introducing something, hopefully a private cloud at the edge. Uh, maybe you could just take Pastor from the scenes briefly. <laughs> My name is Mother I run Siemens uh, Alliances and Partnership Program in the Microsoft platform. Uh, some of you guys might be aware of my sphere. It's one of the, uh, I think, uh, uh, big innovation which Siemens have done in years of uh, their technology. So we are focused on the industrial IoT uh, platform of this device here, and I'm based in Palo Alto. More than happy to help if anybody has any questions. We are building a pretty unique kind of part ecosystem for MySphere, trying to work with different levels of device, edge, as well as application developer. On top of that, this is a central team to the entire my uh, Siemens stuff. Thanks. And um, sure. My name is uh, Sundar Krish. I'm the founder and CEO of a uh, small venture back startup called Wacom.io. Uh, uh, Wacom basically offers a mobile app for manufacturing IoT. Uh, we sell, you know, mainly to process manufacturing. And this is an app that a worker can use to uh, remotely monitor the machines as well as, you know, orchestrate, you know, work manufacturing, complex manufacturing workflows. We also do a lot of, you know, ML. We kind of look at past workflows and, you know, we also make suggestions, you know, or prescriptive maintenance, right? So, uh, I've been in some events before and happy to be here. Uh, I'm Christos Colliers with Orange and uh, our San Francisco office. 
uh, working on uh, IoT and national IoT and LoRa specifically, and looking at uh, synergies between uh, IoT and mobile networks. So, if you're interested, come and talk to me later on. Thank you. I am uh, Ashish Khan from uh, Relayer. We are a uh, company headquartered in Germany. We are funded by KPCB and also uh, Munich Ray. Uh, one of our uniqueness is that uh, we guarantee the business outcomes uh, using our IoT. So let's say a factory wants certain OE improvement or equipment maker wants a certain uptime guarantee. So we guarantee that using our IoT stack. Thank you. Great, great, great idea. And finally, I'm Sarah from Enterprise Ireland. <laughs> yeah, so obviously you all know that Dagra is a uh, Dagra is an Irish company, so Sarah's here from Enterprise Ireland, the government organization. So, uh. Hi, I'm Sarah Hill, um, SVP of Advanced Technologies at Enterprise Ireland in Mountain View. So basically we're the venture arm of the Irish government, and we have 30 offices worldwide that help Irish companies expand and export to new markets, and Dagra is, is one of our companies. Cheers, thanks, Sarah. Maybe, maybe uh, just finally Tack, you, uh, Tack actually presented at our last meetup uh, from Sorco. So great six song, success story, so maybe just say a few words again. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tack. Uh, I'm uh, coming from a company called Soracom. We do uh, IoT connectivity as a service. So if you need any, any sort of connectivity for your IoT, uh, contact me. Thanks. Thank you. And, uh, this company was acquired by, by the biggest, second biggest telco in Japan for uh, probably 100 billion or, yeah, so pretty impressive. Um, so <coughs> I'd like to welcome Sarah, Sarah Peach, the Senior Director for IoT for, as I said, a small company called Samsung. So maybe a round of applause for Sarah. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, I'm going to stand up here so you can see me, I'm not that tall. Um, so, uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. I am representing Samsung. I'm Sarah Peach, and what I'll do is I'll just give a brief introduction to myself and then tell you a little bit about what's going on in Samsung and IoT. So, first, to, to myself, you can probably hear that I was uh, uh, born in the UK and uh, started my career in the industrial space at BASF, a big German chemical company and uh, spent uh, a little time then in some startups, US-based startups, um, having sworn that I would never work for a big German company again, joined Siemens, <laughs> and very much enjoyed <laughs> 10 years at Siemens. Uh, so uh, um, focused initially on, uh, always throughout my time at Siemens, focused on finding new technology that would impact or improve Siemens' own product portfolio and service portfolio. Um, so that started with the automotive group, uh, Siemens BDO, and I worked also for the lighting group, and, uh, but most of the time was with the digital factory division, uh, which is the division that, that uh, hosts uh, the Mindsphere platform. So uh, uh, fascinating time at, at Siemens. Um, it's worth spending time in big German companies, that's, that's the motto I think here. Um, and then a year and a half ago I joined Samsung. Uh, Samsung as you, you probably think of Samsung as, a, as your phone and, or your fridge, um, Samsung made a very, very large commitment to IoT uh, five years ago, no, th three years ago, uh, that by 2020, every uh, Samsung uh, consumer appliance would be IoT ready, essentially able to connect to the internet by 2020. So that's, that's a vast number of connected devices uh, and, and a very bold commitment. So Samsung made this a couple of years ago. We're now two years from that goal and, and, and we'll meet it. So from a, from a consumer point of view, Samsung's definitely um, committed to IoT. From a more B2B perspective, Samsung's also um, uh, developed, and that's where I'm working right now, uh, an IoT platform that's intended to help OEMs, uh, device manufacturers, product manufacturers get to market faster and more securely uh, with smart connected products. And that platform consists of several components, uh, both hardware, so this is embedded hardware, 
that allows you to add intelligence, memory, and connectivity to your appliance or to your product. It could be an industrial product, it could be a consumer product, and uh, also a cloud platform that allows you to manage those devices and provide services uh, based on those devices. So that's the, the IoT offering. The name of the offering is Artic, A-R-T-I-K. Happy to tell you more about it um, uh, during the evening or, or after. Um, the focus of Artic, I mentioned, is a B2B platform, is an enterprise platform, and our focus is on actually three vertical markets. The first is industrial, which is why I'm here, and uh, we're also focusing on buildings, primarily commercial buildings, and the third vertical is consumer and appliances. Obviously, we have a uh, large internal customer uh, for that vertical. So, uh, um, the key key differentiators, as you all know, there are a lot of there are a lot of platforms out there. There are about 450 IoT platforms out there, and, and I think hopefully we'll get into this in the discussion. But at some point, there's going to be a degree of consolidation, and uh, I think. The view on, on who will win the platform war is that there won't be a single winner, that each platform will have, or each, each one of the platforms that, uh, that survives is going to have a particular capability uh, that differentiates itself. And it might be a vertical capability uh, for a particular market, healthcare or something like that, that it complies with particular regulations, or it could be that it does one thing particularly well, um, better, better than other clouds. So you'll see a, a sort of federation of clouds um, in the future, um, uh, rather, than, rather than a single cloud. And we have focused uh, very, very uh, hard on security. We think that security is critical. Um, it's critical, but nobody wants to pay for it, <laughs> which is a challenge. Um, so we've essentially built security into all of our products. You don't pay extra for it. Um, all of our products have, uh, um, have security built in, and so we've really spent a lot of time focusing on that. That's critical for the industrial market. We hope that it will become critical uh, for some of the other markets that we're into. So that's a brief brief introduction to um, my, my personal responsibility at Samsung is uh, business development uh, with a focus on the industrial market, um, and so that's what I'm uh, working on right now. Thank you very much, Sarah. And Sarah will be back to um, sit on the panel. So um, if anyone has any questions for for Samson, uh, she there. Yeah. Um, so next we have our keynote speaker, who is Ben Ziang uh, from uh, Ingram Micro, the largest IT and IoT distributor in the world. So I've been actually trying to get Ben to do this meetup for for the last four months. So I finally got him. So I'm really looking forward to uh, this presentation. So. Everybody just welcome, Ben. Thank you very much. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think I will stay over here because I have a presentation to control. So, for those of you that don't know you I grow, you know, I think we're one of the largest companies in the world that there's many, many people that just don't really know who we are or what we do. And so my goal tonight really is to spend a few minutes to talk about Ingram Micro, who we are, what businesses are we involved in, and why we're interested in IoT. just uh, move on to the next slide. Yeah. 
All right, so Ingram Micro, we are the world's largest IT distributor. So what that means is essentially we buy products from large companies such as Dell, Cisco, VMware, and then we resell to resellers. So in terms of revenue, so this is actually about two years old, $42 billion in revenue. Last year, we finished the year at around $47 billion, so we grew quite a bit. Uh, we have sales in 160 countries. We uh, are number 64 on the Fortune 100 before we were acquired by h and Group, and we ship over 500 million units per year. So essentially, you know, as you can see from some of the stats, we touch a lot of different products. Here, in this slide, you'll basically see our revenue breakdown around the world. So we do almost 18 billion in North America, 12 billion in Europe, 10 billion in uh, APAC, Middle East, Turkey, and Africa, and then 2.7 billion in Latam. Essentially, no matter where you are in the world, Ingram Micro can be a very good partner for you. And these are some of the vendors that we work with and some of our customers. So we have over 1,700 vendor partners and over 200,000 customers. And the logos here represent a small sample of, uh, of some of our partners. And you'll see these are some of the largest companies in the world, and we provide a number of different uh, services for them. And from these services, we've got the broadest product offering and availability for all of our resellers. So again, you know, for over 30 years, we're about 35 years old, we essentially have, uh, have been in the broadline distribution business. Now, over the last couple of years, we've really seen different trends in IT distribution. We've seen that margins have compressed over time, and so because of that, we, as every other distributor has, has started to do, uh, we started to look at different service businesses in order to improve our gross margin uh, and improve our operating income margins. So from an operating standpoint around the world, you can see all the countries that we operate in. So we literally cover every major country in the world. Now, as I was mentioning, one of the things that we started to do about seven or eight years ago is we started to look at the value chain and we wanted to see which areas can we expand our service offerings in order to deliver additional value to our reseller partners. And in order to do that, we've done a number of acquisitions. So we've done over $2 billion of acquisitions since 2012 in a number of areas, primarily in core distribution. Uh, we've expanded into mobility and life cycle services. So what that means is we've really built a business that allows us to deliver the entire life cycle of a mobile product, from shipping a product out, uh, to doing the, uh, the returns, to doing uh, IT assets acquisition, and others. For cloud, through a number of acquisitions, we built a really robust cloud business. So our cloud business this year, or sorry, last year, will be about half a billion dollars. We have over two million seats that we sold ourselves. And really, our value proposition in cloud has been to create one single pane of glass to make it very easy for our resellers to buy, provision, and bill for cloud services from some of the largest partners in the world, including Microsoft and Dropbox. And then for commerce and fulfillment, uh, we have a very unique business. It's essentially free to sell for e-commerce businesses. So a couple years ago, we saw that you know, one of our core areas of expertise is logistics. And so we have tons of warehouse space. We're very, very good at doing fulfillment. So we thought, why don't we do fulfillment for uh, e-commerce businesses? And so we bought a company called Shipwire, based here in Central. And one of the services that we provide is we work for e-commerce businesses, and we connect to their e-commerce platform. And when an e-commerce business gets an order, that order comes directly to us, to one of our warehouses, where we house their inventory and we fulfill their order. So those are essentially the ancillary businesses that we've expanded into in order to bolster our uh, core business. So here's some of the accolades that we've gotten around the world from our key vendor partners. Uh, you'll see that we win essentially distributor of the year for many, many of our key partners. So just want to touch a little bit on worldwide strategy and how we come across a strategy. So at Ingram Micro, we really believe in megatrends. And so we really have based our key strategy around a couple of megatrends, and this is over the last five, 10 years. So one is the number of mobile devices, right? It's nearly three times the uh, global population in 2017. The number of wearable tech market uh, that we've seen is worth about $40 billion by 2020. Um, global e-commerce market uh, reached 2.1 trillion in 2016. Uh, and a third of online shopping transactions are returned. So I think because of some of these mega trends, that's how we essentially develop our service offerings. 
Um, so from the mobility side, we've developed a mobile business. Uh, for the, because of the number of returns that we've seen, we've developed a very robust returns, logist, returns business in terms of a reverse logistics. And that's what we lead into IoT. So we see a lot of statistics around IoT. You guys have seen all sorts of statistics around connected devices. And therefore, we feel that IoT is a natural evolution for Uber Micro. And here's a summary of essentially our overall strategy. So at the core, we have our technology solution business. So this is the business where we're essentially buying and selling technology products, IT products. And around our core business, we have three major business units right now. We have lifecycle services, which is device lifecycle management. This is mostly for mobile products. We have commerce and fulfillment services, which is going to be the e-commerce business that I just mentioned. And then we have cloud services. So that leads me into Internet of Things. So why is Ingram Micro interested in IoT? Well, we think that IoT is the next technology megatrend, I'm sure as all of you do. Uh, we are already selling IoT globally. So to date, we've got about at least a dozen countries selling IoT products, IoT services. We're selling components, we're selling sensors, we're selling gateways, and we've been doing this for years. And we even have some countries that are selling end-to-end -end solutions through partnership with system integrators. Um, we see IoT as a natural evolution of our product portfolio. You know, we, we basically, through our core partners, uh, we are getting additional IoT products added to our portfolio on a weekly basis, and that's just a natural evolution of uh, how products are transforming. We believe that we can help our resellers and their customers solve business problems. I think that's one of the key philosophies that we want to get into as we are building out our, our IoT business, because, you know, Without having a core IoT team at Ingram Micro focused around IoT, our business units will automatically sell IoT products. However, we feel that there's much more value to be delivered to our customers uh, in terms of helping them solve business problems. And that's what we hear day in and day out from all of our resellers as well as the end, end customers that they serve. And so we feel that there's a unique position for us, which is we leverage our partnerships in the value chain and we can bring together vendors, ISVs, service providers, and resellers. So what role can Ingram, uh, Ingram Micro play in the IoT value chain? So one of the things that we did when we first started looking at IoT, and this was a while back, is that we really wanted to go out with the low hanging fruit. And in order to do so, we went out and we spent many, many hours talking to all of our key vendor partners. We spent <coughs> many, many meetings talking to our resellers, we polled some of their end customers, we've been to many events, and we found a couple of very interesting things that's helping us shape our direction. So the first is most players are focused on the get to market, very few players that we've seen are focused on the go to market piece. So that's an opportunity for us. You know, that's one of the things that I think you guys just heard from Samsung, that they're putting together the, the get to market. And I'm sure, uh, from your interactions with other folks in this area, you've seen that many companies are focused on piecing together the technology components to deliver a solution. Now, one of the areas of strength for Ingram Micro is that we're very good at going to market. We've got 200,000 resellers worldwide. We have access to a treasure trove of end user BI data that we can tap into to basically segment by vertical and sell to the right customers. The second thing that we found is that there's actually very few scalable IoT solutions ready to be resold. Uh, most are in proof of concept stage or one-off implementations. You know, one of the things that we originally tried to do when we uh, started doing IoT is we essentially wanted to stick to our core competencies, which is resell other people's products and solutions. And so that's one of the first things that we did. We went out to the market, we went to all of our core vendor partners, and we asked them, what IoT solutions do you have? We would love to resell them. And what we found over time is that many of our core partners that we've worked with for many decades, they were still trying to figure out IoT. You know, they're still in the process of doing uh, proof of concepts. And so we ended up finding it very difficult to find a lot of IoT solutions that are scalable uh, today. The third thing is, the vendors have a very difficult time going direct due to the complex nature of IoT. You know, this is actually, it's a bit easier for smaller and emerging companies in this area because they're able to put together the software, the hardware, and the connectivity. Um, but from the partners that we primarily deal with, we find that you know, 
they, they typically need multiple people. They need multiple people from the connectivity partner to the software partner. We find that hardware vendors uh, are not as great at software as the software guys, and we find the software guys are not as good at putting together the hardware pieces. Talking to some of the operational technology distributors out there uh, and the OT resellers out there, we find that you know, they really need IT expertise for, for IT. Um, and this kind of came about as we talked to some of our IoT resellers, uh, and we really asked them the question, how did you get into IoT? Now, how did you become an IoT reseller? How did you build your expertise? Did you just research this one day and think that this is a great uh, area to, to, to try to learn in and try to build a practice in? And I think in some of the answers that we've gotten are really around the fact that, you know, they came about it because they uh, came across some OT distributors who started selling IoT projects but needed help around the network design, around network security, around you know, uh, around installation of uh, Ethernet cables, and so that's essentially how they are getting into the IoT side, which is they found that OT players they need IT expertise. And the number five thing that we find is that SMBs, our bread and butter, our, our core customers, they have a very difficult time finding and purchasing IoT solutions and being able to deploy them in a time. You know, right now, I think that if you're a small business owner, you really don't know that much about IoT. Like, if you hear it from people, the, the, the one route that you'll go to to find IoT is you'll go online, you'll start Googling, you might come across, you know, some of the big vendors' websites, you might come across some other promoted websites, and once you get into those websites, you might get a little lost because, you know, you see white papers, it's very complex, and at the end of the day, even if you find something that you're interested in, there's not an easy way to buy it. And even if you could buy it, who's going to go out and implement it? So I think that's one of the things that we really heard loud and clear from the SMBs. That's why we're trying to solve this through uh, our offerings. And so what's our IoT value proposition? I think you know I touched on this a few minutes ago, but if you look at the end-to-end -end IoT solution requirement, from our point of view, uh, we see that there are sensors, gateways, connectivity, cloud, analytics, fulfillment, post-sale services and really not one of the partners that we deal with can cover the entire spectrum. So we're not saying that we can cover everything. Well, we're saying that we can work across the hardware and software vendors, the telcos, and the bars to bring together the necessary elements of an IoT solution. We want to be that middleman. We want to be that glue that helps deliver these projects. So how are we partnering with these different uh, partners that we have? So for vendors, they can leverage Ingram Micro's global go-to-market channel and capabilities. You have products, you have a solution, you can come to us, we will focus on helping you sell that solution to we'll increase your sales. For service providers like telcos, you know, we find that many telcos have been doing um, IoT for a number of years, and we recently met with a lot of the major telcos around the world, and we find that you know, they really need good, robust IoT solutions that are easy to communicate, that are easy for their sales teams to sell. And so one of the ways that we're partnering with them is they're coming and talking to us about the solution that we have in our portfolio so that they can focus their sales focus on. Uh, the third part is for resellers, they can leverage our implementation capabilities and network in addition to our portfolio of products. So through our discussions with many, many resellers, we found that there are a small portion of resellers who are doing IoT already. They have the capabilities uh, in-house to launch an IoT project. They have developmental capabilities. But what we find is a lot of our resellers don't have developers on hand. They don't have the knowledge around IoT, and so they're actually very scared of going out and trying to sell an IoT solution. Therefore, they won't even bring it up. And so one of the things that you know, we discussed with them that, uh, that we can offer, which will ease them into IoT, is to put together an implementation partner program for them. And that's basically you know, having the reseller who has the customer go and sell a project, but bring on an implementation partner to go out and actually install, uh, install the project. So just a few closing remarks. So many of our 200,000 reseller partners around the world, they're very excited to get uh, started with IoT, especially with us. And we have major <coughs> announcements to come at the annual Google Micro Cloud Summit on May 30th, sorry, uh, April 30th to May 2nd. And if you're interested in partnering with Ingram Micro, you can shoot me an email. All right, any questions?
I think maybe the questions will come in the panel then. Um, so, one question is um, Brian Kessler from Sea Control Tech. Oh, yeah, I'm going to turn you actually here. Yo, brilliant. Um, so, where's my clicker? Uh, let me get your face up here. Oh, it, I don't use a Mac, so I don't know what the, the, the three fingers. I'll just introduce you briefly. We need picture. We need picture. We definitely we need picture. You look good. You look good. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to say was um, Autodesk. So so Mick here uh, works for Dark and he said, so I get Ingram, I get Dell, I get Samsung, I get Autodesk. So why is Autodesk? And I don't take it as an instance. So why is Autodesk talking about IoT? So I know Brian, I don't know you personally, but I reached out to you on LinkedIn. Uh, but I know his company, Sea Control, and they, they are a, a serious player, one of the pioneers around um, IoT and IoT platforms. Um, so, as I said, I know Brian from Sea Control, which many of you would, would do. Um, and Sea Control, in I think it was 2015, got acquired by Autodesk. So, actually, I'm personally really interested um, as to what Autodesk are doing with um, Sea Control's IoT platform. So, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. All right, so uh, yeah, hello everybody. Um, I don't think I have anything to advance, so I'll just back up. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so Brian Kester um, with Autodesk currently, although this is going to be kind of an interesting uh, chat slash panel because I'm actually leaving Autodesk pretty quickly, so I'll be talking in kind of two different kinds of uh, texts here. Um, yeah, so my company, C Control, was acquired a couple years ago by Autodesk. Um, everybody here is, how many people in the audience are familiar with Nightworks uh, from PTC? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, exactly. Thank you for that. East Coast <laughs> um, Joke, joke. So, uh, yeah, so Sea Control was a quieter version of ThingWorks, and the difference was is that it was 100% uh, cloud based, kind of like Salesforce, and allowed people to build IoT applications, which are um, uh, front end applications. So, it would suck data in from different protocols and devices, and it would analyze the data and then put it on to uh, People that see it the first time will think of those dashboards, but actually, in, some, in most cases, it would be a 50 to 100 web page or mobile page, like application for managing IoT data and kind of extracting insights out of it. So, um, so great, actually, great media. We didn't even kind of um, uh, you know, collaborate on that, but um, a lot of people are really confused about what Autodesk, you know, who Autodesk is and why Autodesk is in this business. So, um, how many people here are familiar with Autodesk? Okay, pretty good number. How many people think of Autodesk as AutoCAD? Okay, pretty pretty good number. So that was the, the number one challenge that I had when I joined Autodesk was that um, I'm from you know, Northern California. I grew up in the Bay Area. Autodesk has always been sort of this iconic company, and I was kind of shocked once I got there to realize that almost nobody really realized that they had done anything but AutoCAD or CAD in general. And so the story with Autodesk is that um, you know it's a rent based a rent company. A rent, I'm sorry, rent county based company that uh, AutoCAD itself was an acquisition by a little bunch of business guys that um, became, you know, still like the dominant player in CAD and in design tools. What's less known about Autodesk over the last 35 years is that it's acquired over 200 other technologies. Um, the year that I was acquired, there were 35 acquisitions and we were the only one announced. Um, so the company's growth engine innovation has been acquisitions since day one. And so, you know, over those three decades plus, there's this huge portfolio of tools that don't just help you design a physical thing out in the world, whether it be this building, which I, I, I guarantee an Autodesk product was used to design something in here, whether it's a Tesla, which is uh, our, our software used heavily in Teslas, or whether it's just some pedestrian industrial machine or appliance or your consumer product that you're wearing today. Um, almost everything in some way, shape, or form is touched by Autodesk. It's not just design software, it's CAD, plus simulation, um, you know, when you design a product, you don't know how it's gonna operate out in the real world. And so you can simulate it, especially with, with the amount of computing horsepower we have these days. In addition to simulation, we also have what we call product lifecycle management tools. So it helps a product manager run the entire cycle of product management from conception to something getting manufactured, getting out in the field, getting serviced, getting revisioned, and a whole different version going out in the world. Um, and it even goes beyond that. In recent years, Autodesk has been investing in 3D printing. It's probably the number one investor in 3D printing in an effort to basically make it really easy to hit the print button. 
in your design tool and say, I've designed something, how do I just make it? Um, and, and make now is not just 3D printing, but it's also potentially printing something at an EMS company in China or, or somewhere in Asia, or at some local quote unquote Kinkos that may have a CNC milling machine or some other sort of production equipment. And so if you think about, what do you think about Autodesk, and it's about designing something, um, making it, and then increasingly in the future using it, and that's where IoT comes in. So um, once something's out in the physical world, that's where the IoT sensor data tends to take over and become really, really interesting. Um, you know, my classic use case in IoT, and I've been kind of running the space for 10 years, starting with my uh, my first IoT archive. Well, halfway through my, my, my journey, my first IoT meetup that wasn't an MDM meetup was actually this building back in 2011 or so. Um, we've always been discussing IoT being basically about like aftermarket service, and that's where a lot of the value propositions are. So the Autodesk lifecycle of trying to help our customers, of which there's tens of thousands of them that tend to be in SAP, is about how do I physically design a thing in the world? How do I get it produced? Once it's produced, how do I sense what's going on with it? And then close that loop all the way back to the next generation of design. So that's why Autodesk is in this business. Um, and PTC is actually the number one or two, depending on who you're talking about, Autodesk competitor to, uh, um, to, to Autodesk itself. And so um, our goal has been to basically be the um, sort of counterpoint to the thing works offered in the market, which is low cost software as a service place where you can get your uh, IoT application design and build. Now, I say that, and actually, um, I was brought on board to not only bring tech into the company, but also help them figure out a good strategy. And we're actually going to probably withdraw our market facing uh, platform that they brought, they bought that company for from the market and start taking some of the core tech there and infuse the IoT into all Autodesk products. Because as Ben pointed out in the last slide, um, the, you know, the landscape of the IoT world has not um, matriculated as fast as a lot of people had hoped. Um, and so one of my core jobs is to help Autodesk figure out a strategy. And the reality is, if you're out in the IoT market right now, it takes a tremendous amount of professional services to pull a product together. Um, whether you're an SMB or an enterprise, they all are faced with like the same you know, sort of daunting proposition, which is I have all of computing, starting with the kernel on a device, all the way up to the biggest analytical software and even AI and ML driven software on the web in this giant stack and how do I pull it all together. So it's, a, it's sort of a tremendous systems integration challenge. And um, objectively, you know, um, the reason I mentioned that I'm sort of perishing out of Autodesk for a while is we've set a strategy for the company, still working with them um, in kind of a strategic advisory capacity. Um, but they're not running a business not uh, run by IoT for a while because it is SMB based. Um, as Ben mentioned before, there are some uh, challenges with SMB sort of you know, uh, adopting IoT, and it's going to be uh, manifesting itself in the marketplace in a year or two in both Autodesk products. So if you have a design tool or a simulation tool or a PLM tool, IoT data will just be there in the tool itself, the other Autodesk products. And at some point in the future, they may launch um, you know, another platform based on those technologies. Um, so when we did the panel, I'm happy to answer any more questions about um, the IoT platform wars because uh, an interesting cycle that I've gone through is that I've, I've been a, a cheerleader for IoT, but not a, a not a hype monger. And so it's a very it's a place where you have to be you know kind of sober about what your business plans are and what your strategies are, and like not get too far ahead of yourself and kind of know um, as ben, actually Ben had some great leading you know, concepts what your core competencies are. So like an Autodesk case. Um, not very good at professional services, does not want to be good at professional services. So it makes no sense to try and be the lead on an IoT platform. So let's get this into all of our tools. So, um, you know, I've seen this sort of uh, industry grow since, um, you know, roughly 2004 or five from the machine to machine days up till now. And we're, I feel like we're just sort of on the precipice of, of, a, of a good explosion of like commercial and economic activity, but we're not quite there yet. So. Um, and so it's, it's continues to be great to go to audiences like this and kind of see what the state of the state is, particularly here in the uh, force field bubble of uh, Northern California and Silicon Valley. So uh, look forward to, and I see some familiar faces in the crowd, so look forward to talking to the panel and talking to folks afterwards. I just wanted to ask you, Brian, have you mentioned at the start to talk that uh, you're deep in Autodesk? Yeah. So do you have any, like, can you tell us what you're doing next, your next venture? Yeah, I, I used to be, a, I had the unfortunate slash fortunate uh, uh, 
TSP at BC a long time ago. So I've, I've worked, there's a bunch of venture firms that I'm working with on their IoT startups, and um, you know, and I'm sort of trying to figure that out. It's a little bit of a cliche, but most people have been had a run with the company and worked with the big company for a couple of years. Uh, you need to kind of take a breather, so I'm going to take a breather and you know, work with a bunch of startups and see what's see what's next. So I'm really excited about autonomous driving and a couple other cases. Uh, one thing that's brought to mind, I suppose, just as you were talking, I don't know if many of you have listened to Gartner's analytics, analytics on the way the market's going, but a, a digital twin, I don't know if a lot of people hear that the digital twin from Gartner were kind of, in terms of Autodesk and what they do, digital twin just kept springing to mind, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> we recently had um, Shane Kyo uh, from IBM. And we were fortunate enough that Jason Shepard was in the Bay Area this week uh, from Austin. Um, if you see, if you see actually down the bottom, we have Dell Technologies and Dabra, and my company. Um, Dell is actually a sponsor of this IoT meetup, so they sponsored the meetup when we had, you know, about forty people coming. So they're our original sponsor. So I'm delighted to have um, Jason back again. Yeah. Cheers. You got a, a bigger crowd than last time I was here. We were in the game too. Yeah, we graduated, I guess. <laughs> um, so if I go narcoleptic on you at any point, it's gonna end up all day driving around the bay, like eating with people. I'm really tired, so hopefully I, I stay awake. But um, glad I could be here. I just happened to be coming through, and so uh, the cancellation is good. So, 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 so I actually, uh, if you guys don't know about Dell Technologies, or I think most people know about Dell. Um, Dell Technologies is the portfolio after the EMC acquisition, so that's Dell, Dell EMC from the server side, Pivotal, VMware, SecureWorks, RSA, Virtue Stream. It's, it's the family of businesses. So I started, I mean, I've been doing R&D, CTL type stuff for a long time. I started IoT at Dell, blank sheet of paper, a small group, group of us are like, what do we want to do with this buzzword IoT? Um, we built it up, and, I mean, obviously it's about services, it's about selling outcomes, it's about business value, software, but you also, you know, you've got the acquire data. We wanted to drive this thinking around edge computing as we were looking at it. I'm not gonna say that Dell drove, you know, everyone talking about edge on our own, but we certainly have been talking about it for four years. So. And so if you pay attention to the news, I'd like to say everyone four years ago had their head in the cloud. Um, now everyone's talking about edge. It's not really about one or the other, it's just you have to have distributed architecture. So we spent a lot of time from the beginning of our strategy going after um, you, know, you know, this notion of distributed computing, and you know, we'll keep talking about it tonight, I'm sure. We built it out initially with this notion of these edge gateways, these embedded PCs. How can I turn embedded compute into uh, something that really scales out? Because if you look at the market today, you basically have the Raspberry Pi on one end, you've got really, really nice but very expensive boutique industrial equipment on the other end, and everything in the middle looks like it was made in your garage. That's IoT. IoT, to scale, has to have security, has to have management, has to have global support. You need tier one benefits. And so we're like, hey, let's come in and do what we did for PCs and servers. Um, let's come industrialize you know, uh, these devices. You get all those with tier one benefits. That was the start of our strategy, of course. It's not just about a box. So my job was to make them not paperweights. So, so I, I built out our partner strategy. Um, how do we you know, kind of approach the market from the greater you know, uh, picture? Um, so initially, our strategy was driven from Dell. You know, once EMC happened, the EMC acquisition, you know, I was responsible for Dell Technologies, and it was kind of the, the Dell tail wagging the dog. Um, the VMware business launched uh, Pulse IoT Center, if you've heard of that. It's a kind of air watch on steroids for, for uh, device management, you know, things and gateways and distributed compute and all that. Um, of course, we've got things from, um, you know, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. We've got assets around, you know, core infrastructure, of course, you know, server storage networking. Uh, RSA recently launched RSA Labs for um, edge security. We ex extend all our security practice you know, down to the edge. Um, but we are not apologetic or we're not confused about what we're doing. We are a software and hardware infrastructure <coughs> for, for the IoT solutions. Very, very strategically you know, early on, do not compete with the analytics providers. Like, do not compete with people generating insights. All of the people that were doing IoT before it was ever called IoT. It's just a total buzzword. It's about sensor-driven analytics, and all the different data sources that are out there, and creating business value. 
So that's our approach is hardware software infrastructure. You know, we'll talk probably more during the, the night about like like you know, kind of a lot of things, but very very deliberately built up our partner program around getting that domain expertise in. Very deliberately over three years, got a bunch of companies in the mix, and then we started. If you've heard of the EdgeX Foundry project, we started that in July of 2015. Um, literally, I was driving around, kind of like I was doing today, and I was like, man, this is not going to work. We have too many platforms reinventing the basics over and over and over again. So I called up my, my CTO team and I'm like, hey, if I can get some money, what if we did this? That's how EdgeX Foundry, if you've heard of it, started. It's literally like, let's go build a right platform for distributed computing. Let's get a bunch of people and herd cats for three years, or how long it took, and it was about two and a half years, and then let's just go give it away to stabilize the market. And so now there's like 70 companies backing it. Uh, what you don't see is there's another 100 behind that coming. Uh, there's a lot of customers using it. There's a lot of stuff happening, and it's, we have to stabilize the market where it doesn't matter to be different. Get around more common APIs that bind this stuff together, and then this scales out. So there's a, there's a lot of things we've been doing strategically, and I'll get into more of it. I'll also say, and I don't want to take up too much time, is we talk too much about technology and not enough about the value. Too many people, there's too many solutions looking for problems. It's crazy like how many solutions there are out there that don't have a lot of value behind them. And that's what some of the struggle is. We see uh, the number one and number two problems in IoT have nothing to do with technology. It's a business case. Is there a reason to risk, add risk and complexity to my life? You know, it's, 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 it's tricky. Number two problem, this is actually the biggest problem. We, we, we meet with the biggest companies in the world, I'm sure many of you guys do too. It's IT versus OT versus the LOB. Everybody wants to, you know, you can't go to a conference without the, the, the Venn diagram of IT and OT coming together. But, but, you know, how much do people really know of the dynamics? I don't know. We've introduced CIOs at the biggest companies you know to their OT department, you know, in the meeting. You know, um, we, 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 we see the OT people that are going around IT, shadow IT, because they don't think that they'll want to work with them. But meanwhile, the same company, the biggest companies you can imagine, the IT department comes in, with, you know, someone after that, and they're like, hey, I just wish I could you know, work more with the operations group. You know, I, I wish that um, I could turn into a profit center instead of a cost center. We see it all the time. You know, I'm sure you guys do. Oh, and then the line of business just goes and bypasses everybody and buys SaaS. If you can't figure out those problems, you can talk all you want about IoT and solutions and all that, you won't sell much at all. Because that is, that's what's the roadblock, is, is the people problem. So we're doing a lot of stuff around, how do I invest in, in you know, meeting the needs of these different groups? Uh, all of our strategy from Dell Technologies is, is you know, my, those are my three roles of IoT, and it's all about decoupling things. <coughs> This market right now is, is vertical platforms that are laser focused on one use case is what sells. And the big peanut butter platforms are struggling because when you try to be everything to everybody, no, no one knows what to do with you. And so what we're seeing is these very, very small focused platforms, and, and I think many of you guys that we've worked with, or some of you in the room, they're doing really cool stuff. Those are the ones that sell. What happens, what's happening right now is we go sell them to a major customer with a small platform. We bring the IT credibility, they bring this kind of OT knowledge and this focus. We do a one use case and we sold things where we sell like five, 10,000 systems into some cold chain retail place or something for oil and gas or whatever. And then the customer's like, hmm, great, I'd like to do this. You know, I've been uh, successful in my grocery store and my refrigeration. Now I want to do, you know, uh, real time offers or video surveillance or whatever. And then people are like, well, I don't do that. And so now you've got to bring another set of technology because it's all you know, verticalized. So what we're doing, all of our investments, we've been doing this for, for, for years, <coughs> we're doing it as open way as possible. I give away millions of dollars worth of work to open source because I want to drive more the consistency because consistency drives scale and I'm in a scale business. you got to decouple software from hardware. So be independent and run on anything. I said six on them, I don't care. So decouple it. That's a, these are kind of cloud native principles. Loosely coupled microservices so you can transport this stuff anywhere it wants to go. You have to decouple the things from the applications. Too many things have a dedicated application and then all of the API integrations in the cloud. So literally, if you want to do a, a thing that's hard coded to an application and you want to have it run at an, a mining site or an oil rig and they have almost no connectivity, it's broken because you can't integrate in the cloud and you have no connectivity. So what, what, what a lot of our strategy, including with EdgeX, which we're doing very openly, is decouple that like right at the thing and expose an API so now I can do integration from the edge to the cloud at any point in between. So 
That's rule number two, decouple things from applications as close to the things as possible. And now that thing can be transported across any application instead of you know, all these silos. And then the third one is you've got to decouple skills <coughs> from technology. It's, it's, there's too many vertical platforms today. We need really good horizontal technology that you apply domain knowledge to. It's, the market's going through, through a transition right now. We've been watching it for about three years. We're, we're investing in, in you know, giving stuff away in open ways. We need to get to where we have fundamental technologies, best-in-class plug-in, pure play ingredients, and then more skills that apply that knowledge. And then you know, the stuff from an Ingram standpoint, like that go-to-market, delivering that value to customers, that's how this market scales. Not being the hundredth person this week to write a, a Modbus power meter graph. It doesn't scale. So it's like, I always say, democratize the South so you can, uh, so you can monetize the North. And there's, there's, there's so many things that we have to do in, as a market to get, get to the value and then also focus on the people side because that's the biggest thing in terms of I'll, I'll talk more about it as we go and then kind of off. Um, so we've spent a lot of time there. You know, now we're getting into advanced class, you know, GPUs, you know, the co-processing, you know, everyone's favorite buzzword, blockchain. It's really important, but you know, it's, it's a total buzzword right now. Um, uh, you know, obviously AI and all that. Um, you know, how do I get censored through uh, trust? The holy grail of IoT is new business models, and the holy grail of that is selling your data to people that you don't even know. And how do you do that? You can do it with open frameworks and standards and root of trust at the sensor level so that people trust without having to build a, build a business relationship with them, that your data is real. That's a long ways out, but that's where we're kind of headed. And if you want to do IoT, Internet of Things, you have to have common open frameworks, you have to have interoperability. So that's our investment. So I'll, 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 I'll cover it more as we go. But, we're in the scale business. We think it's really important to work with partners. I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to compete with people that are adding all this value when we enable. We also have to start, you know, stop reinventing things. So that's kind of what we're all about. And I'm glad to talk with you guys. I'll do a shameless plug. I'm hiring for my new group in, uh, in uh, you know, Intel Technologies. Uh, so hit um, uh, me up on LinkedIn and whatnot and find out uh, what's growing afterwards. But uh, uh, good stuff. But Did you want to mention the role, sir? <laughs> Well, if you let me keep being shameless, I'll do it. Um, yeah, so, I'm, so as kind of the CTO and driving our strategic partnerships, our ecosystem, um, we're hiring actually across our whole new division. So uh, I didn't mention this. Basically what happened is, is we've been doing it from Dell for a while, and Michael wanted to flip it upside down. So the past nine months, I've been working with, with corporate strategy and Ray O'Farrell, who's the VMware CTO. He's now my new boss. He's like wearing two hats. CTO of VMware plus the GM of our new Dell Technology Solutions Division. We're hiring um, you know, kind of CTO type folks, solution product managers, um, uh, the, you know, some more strategic partner managers. We're gonna have field architects, solution architects, developers, I mean, you, know, you name it. We've, we've had an investment for a while, but, but we're picking it up a notch as, as a portfolio business. Um, our partner programs are moving under the, the Dell Tech umbrella, so. A lot of stuff coming, I don't wanna to take too much time, but it just, <coughs> Let's focus on the value first and foremost. I think that's the biggest thing that too many people miss. Like, it's like, guys, it's not about the technology. We know that, sorry, one last thing. We know the wrong customer when they come in and they're like, I want to buy some IoT. Oh, really? Okay, what color would you want? You know, it's like literally the market's telling me that I should do something, so I have to buy some oh, The right customer is like, comes in and we have a, a, a number of these, and then we have some in the middle. The right customer is like, I have a business imperative, and I saw it by June, I'm screwed. And, and the line of business is backing it, not just the IT person, but I can help the line of business get on board with IT and then we'll all work together and then it's successful. So that's the right customer. And then in the middle, it's like, this is a lot of people. Um, I know I have to do something, my execs say to do something, we have these problems, help me find the right use case and then we'll go accelerate you know, with that or whatever. So help me do that last little bit. Those are good too. I really like the ones that say, I'm, I'm screwed if I don't solve it by June. But, you know, not always the case. But, I could go on forever. We, we learned a lot, like we're still learning, but it's, it's really, it's fun, but it's, it's also, we got to focus on the value and, and, and talk just about the technology. I'm giving myself a bit. <laughs> and, uh, and, just, and just when Jason says, we're hard, and Jason's hard. So, uh, Jason, Jason put this up. Sorry, you told me to say that my, my new boss is Irish. So yeah, that's true. Ray, <laughs> he's Irish. <laughs> Obviously, you know I'm Irish. And so, so Jason put up, the, he had like a senior director for IoT role with Dell Technologies and he put it up on LinkedIn during the week and like I commented on it and saying, oh yeah, whatever, I just liked it and commented on it. 
And I think I got about five phone calls. Like, you know Jason, you know Jason, can you, can you put in a good word for me? And then I got like LinkedIn messages trying to connect with to Jason. But anyway, um, he's here today, so if anyone's interested in the roles, then talk to him. Um, so before we jump into the panel, well, actually, we have Jason. Let me, let me put up your face here. Actually, I only have a little face of you. <laughs> um, so we're going to jump into the panel before, uh, before we go do the panel. So uh, Jesse is, Jesse DeVessa is going to be moderating the, the panel. Um, he's going to introduce the company Memento. They're an absolutely amazing company. Uh, I'm sure most of you know Memento. Um, probably back to some of the brightest IoT early stage. I think they're very early stage PC company. Um, they've done some very good investments. They're also actually for Jason. Actually, they do executive search um, as well in terms of IoT. They're just everybody just knows the meta. And um, so you know, Jesse, do more better introduction than I will, and then he just start off the panel. So cheers, cheers, Jesse. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hi everyone. I'm Jesse DeMesa. I'm a strategy partner with Momenta Partners. I've been with Momenta for a year and a half. So a little bit about Momenta. I'm, not, I'm sure there's a few of you who don't know about Momenta. Momenta is a, we focus on connected industries. So we're a services company that provides executive search. So basically if you're looking for digital technology leaders, digital transformation, IoT leadership on the technology side, sales side. So this applies to both early stage tech companies that are maybe going through getting Series A, Series B funding. But this also applies to a lot of the large companies on the other side of the ecosystem, enterprise, infrastructure, IT players like the Cisco's of the world, the Dell's of the world, et cetera, all the way to the industrial large global companies like Schneider Electric, we've placed a number of leadership there, and a lot of other global players around the world. Also, in, in terms of we do investments, we do seed and venture stage, we do seed and Series A investments currently. We're currently raising our second fund that's focused purely on connected industries. So that's a whole basket of technologies, but everything around enabling a lot of the business outcomes that, that Jason's basically talking about. So IT, IoT sometimes is this broad word, but, or sometimes it's used a little more narrowly, but it can be everything from AI, predictive maintenance, machine learning, platforms, all the time. Don't really look at platforms as much anymore because there's hundreds of them. And basically any kinds of early stage tech companies, we, we actually, invest in those companies, and we actually provide also the third pillar of momentum is advisory services. And we provide advisory for both early stage companies looking to go to market and help them with their growth or access to markets through our network. Both of our, our network is pretty expansive across large stage ecosystem companies that are adopting technology. It could be the GEs of the world, it could be ADB, it could be a lot of the companies that, that are present today. And uh, what we also do is we advise pretty large companies in terms of landscaping the IoT market space. Maybe they're looking at doing a tuck-in acquisition but starting with a strategic partnership with uh, companies and they want to assess, well, what's the right kind of analytics uh, capability that I might want to bring into my portfolio to achieve a business outcome? But what companies are there that might uh, be able to service both the smart cities uh, segment, manufacturing, energy, oil, and gas utilities. So we, we had Momenta look at about five major ver industry verticals. We look main, we don't look at consumer IoT, we mainly do B, B2B. Uh, so we look at companies that are basically, as far as investments, would actually fit the needs of a lot of the large strategics that we work with and try to work, and we work with their corporate development groups. And we also bring those companies into our, um, into our fund to be limited partners as well. So that's just a little bit about Momentum Partners. We'd like to bring in a little bit of background about myself. Uh, prior to being at Momentum for a year and a half, uh, I was with GE for three years as a CTO for GE Oil and Gas. Momentum likes to bring in a lot of what we call practitioners, so people that have been in the industry. I've also done a couple of successful software startups, and I did work for a big German company because I was a, two German companies invested in my startup, and one of them bought our company was Siemens. So I was with Siemens for quite a while, uh, learning how to work within a large industrial company, and my headquarters was in Germany, so that was actually, enjoyed that actually a lot, or GE actually uh, made me an offer I could have refused to be part of, part of what they were doing in 2013, all the way to when I left in 2016. And so basically that's, you know, I've been in oil and gas markets, I've been in manufacturing, so a lot of people in Momentum on our advisory side 
have been in the industry all the way. We have uh, guys that have been leading Apple Labs, R&D Labs here in the Silicon Valley that have become very successful entrepreneurs and investment bankers. Uh, CIO, CTOs from large industrial companies, Caterpillar, GE, Honeywell, uh, Cisco, a number, of, a number of large companies on both sides of the ecosystem. So we like to, we've all been through this and uh, actually we, we see the market and how it's actually evolving. Maybe not as fast as we'd like to see it evolving, but basically we're trying to help companies on both sides of the ecosystem accelerate their growth programs and initiatives all founded on the enabling capability of, of IoT. So that was a little bit about me. So I'd like to uh, bring up the panelists so we could actually go through some questions with the panelists. Sarah Peach, Jason Shepard, Brian Kester, and Ben Chung. I didn't actually realize I actually knew everybody because some people we met on the phone. That uh, if you've been in this space for a, are you trying to tell me something? They don't want to hear you anymore. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, is there another mic? Is there another mic? We can uh, just pass yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll just pass it. Okay. I'll just sit in back corner. <laughs> you can probably, you probably don't need a company. Okay. Well, I know a lot of you have introduced your company and in, in terms of what your strategy is, what what your core market space was before IoT. But maybe you can expand on that, and, and I know that some of you, and, and Ben, you went into it a little more depth. What have been the challenges in that transformation for your company, trying to help companies actually get business outcomes from what IoT enables? We've been doing this for probably at least four or five years now. So what's been the challenges from your perspective for each of your companies? So I think for Ingram Micro, really we are mostly a traditional uh, company, and I think that one of the biggest challenges is making sure that we have the right talent and the right resources on hand, and it's working through our traditional processes. I think you know when we're talking about IoT, uh, as an example, one of the issues that we recently started facing is as we're bringing on board uh, new IoT vendors with the IoT solutions. You know, we've had challenges in terms of just getting our system to be able to sell hardware and recurring software in one sale. You know, that sounds like something that's pretty simple for a startup to figure out, but for a 40 something billion dollar company, it's actually quite difficult. And I think back to, you know, what Jason mentioned earlier about solving uh, business uh, problems and actually delivering value and delivering outcomes, you know, that's the way that we've really started our IoT business thinking about. Because you know my background is I'm not really I don't really have an IT background. My background is in finance. It's working with an entertainment company. I, I used to work at Sony. Then I worked for the Citic Group over in China. And then I started my own consulting firm. And so I've really been all over the world. And at the same time, right now I'm fortunate enough to sit on the board of a bank uh, based out of Irvine. It's about a billion dollar bank with 200 employees. So I see the difficulties of a small business and what they have to deal with. And, uh, and I also own a restaurant in, uh, in, in Southern California. So how many of you have actually heard of Bonchon here in the Bay Area? So I actually own Bonchon over in, uh, in Orange County. And you know, for my business, it's, a, it's an SMB type of uh, restaurant franchise. And there's constant issues that I'm facing, whether it's my fridge is, is goes out, brand new fridge, went out three times this past year. I lost hundreds of dollars of food. Uh, whether it is making sure that my employees are doing their job and clocking in and clocking out at the right time, making sure that my, the analytics look proper in terms of, you know, I need to know the type of demographics of people who are coming to my store so I need, so that I can properly market to the right people. You know, these are all things that as a small business owner, I would gladly pay a couple hundred dollars per month to get this type of uh, service. And so I think that's the type of, you know, that's the direction that we're kind of looking at from Ingram Micro in terms of for all of our SMB customers, uh, the, the actual the customers of our resellers, we really want to drive down and look at all the business use cases and figure out how we can help them solve those business cases so that we can go out and find the IoT solutions that can solve those cases. And so that'll help us uh, sell. Now, one of the other things I just wanted to mention, the other challenge is, um, you know, we find talking to our resellers, they're telling us a lot of their customers aren't coming to them asking for IoT because they don't know IoT. 
They don't know what it can do. They don't know the benefits of IoT. You know, and, and I, I like to think of this similar to a couple of years ago, not in the Bay Area, but throughout most of the US and other parts of the world. You know, imagine before you had Dropbox, you didn't really know the benefits of cloud storage. You know, most people, when they first heard about Dropbox, or most non-technical people, they thought of it as basically just another place to store your, your, your files. They didn't know of the incremental benefits and the unique ways that you can use it to sync up all your files in different computers. And I think with IoT, it's, it's something that's similar, where there's a huge educational curve that we have to kind of overcome as we're training our sales folks to sell these solutions to end customers. Yeah, so I think a challenge that, that, that Samsung is facing in this evolving IoT market is probably very common to, to other IoT companies, either in this room uh, or, or beyond, is that you need to focus on, you know, understand what it is that you do well and try to avoid doing everything. Um, I, as I described, we have a platform uh, at Samsung, we have both hardware, um, firmware, software, and a cloud piece. Uh, but we're not a services organization, and yet we have great tier one customers who come to us, and they want us to, they want to use our platform, but they also want us to help them use the platform. And, and so we have to be consciously deciding always how, how far do we want to be along that spectrum of providing a product or providing an end-to-end -end service to implement uh, the solution. And, and I think this is uh, something that is sort of a general challenge, and you, you mentioned it uh, in your introduction too, um, that uh, you need to decide what, you, what you're doing and not get too uh, caught up in what a customer may need, you know, find, find where the edge of your offering is. Yeah, I guess just to add to that and some comments I made earlier, so the big thing that Autodesk discovered that actually was a little bit of a shock to me was, um, so the Autodesk customer is typically a product manager at best, or more, more often like a civil engineer, some other sort of like day-to-day -day engineering manager type person who's buying you know, lots and lots of seats of design software and some other you know, things I mentioned earlier. Um, there actually is a services organization on Autodesk that was doing about 5% of it was doing what I would call like enterprise grade work, which I've been in enterprise software pretty much my whole career, so it's a thing that I just kind of live and eat and breathe every day. Um, what, what I was I was shocked at the last couple of years with Autodesk was the position they have with the customers. Um, the customers were coming in and asking for McKinsey level strategic advisory. Um, so they would play the technology, they play with the platform, we had some verticalized solutions that were you know plug and play, but um, long and short of it was there's a, 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 a gaping, sucking chest wound for um, relatively economical like management consulting for whether it's an SMB or the largest companies in the world to even run like a week or two long workshop with Jesse helps with. Um, but you guys are actually so big, right? Right now. Um, that can work someone through just, you know, a suite of value propositions, drill through those and go iterate up in the market. So, um, you know, just to add some color to some of the things I said earlier, that's kind of one of the reasons that we, we you know, I, I recommended that we kind of, you know, diverge from like trying to sell things for the market was that, if you can't provide the whole solution in your large company um, and you have a certain position with your customers, they expect things out of you that you have to make a decision whether you want to offer or not. And that's kind of one of the conundrums for large employers in the market is to figure out where their position is. And you know, um, a lot of times in business, it's like where and how often you say no versus which yeses you go after. And so that's the real conundrum in the space where there's just a giant, you know, complicated stack of stuff where everyone's a platform player. So if I have a kernel level thing, I'm a platform player. AI platform on the platform player, so there you go. Yeah, for Dell, I mean, our, our, I mean, it's great that as Dell Technologies, we touch probably almost every customer you can imagine because of the breadth of the portfolio, but the problem is that we know mostly the IT people. So this is also why we're like, hey, you know, you can play to your strengths, and we started partnering with a lot of these operations-focused companies. Um, and they're struggling with IT. And so uh, you, you've seen play out, I don't want to mention names, some of the OT players trying to like, you know, basically own everything and some of the IT players trying to own everything. It took them a couple years to get out of their system, but now everyone's like, oh, okay, it takes a village, we should actually partner instead of talking about partnering. Like, it was a logo exercise for a while, but now people mean a you know, real life thing. Um, we have, uh, so we've got a lot of relationships we built. We've been selling into big OEMs, you know, your, your, 
you know, GEDs and Yoko Gawa, ABB, Honeywell, and all that for a long time. When we started making industrial grade looking equipment, we got the, hey, wait a minute, you know, I thought you were our, our friend and now you're competing with me. But then you know, folks started realizing that we can do it better when it comes to compute, the ruggedized compute in many cases. And hey, let me put your label on it and it'll also say Dell on it somewhere and then IT will be cool with it and that'll be the bridge to the operation, the, the process. So we've seen a lot of stuff that went from um, you know, hey, wait, you're my competitor all of a sudden to executive direction, you will buy the box from them. So we've seen that transition. Um, but you know, mainly it's just kind of you know, finding out where the strengths are and, and it's, it's been a three year process, I think, for everybody to figure out what's your go-to dance move and then kind of rip off a little bit, but, but don't try to do too much. And then the, the business transformation thing, digital transformation, another buzzword, but you know, um, but, but Relayer, you know, we know we work with Relayer and, and that this whole thing about let me insurance, or, you know, insure your gains, you know, that's interesting. Uh, we're looking, we have Dell Financial Services, it's a huge bank. Uh, a lot of companies are, I mentioned IT, OT, LOB, it's a big problem, but also there's a lot of companies that are afraid of investing in transformation because there's an inevitable dip in revenue for about two years typically. And then it takes off and, and you kind of reinvent yourself. So how can we finance people through that dip? So we're starting to look at all kinds of new ways to kind of boost it a bit because that's these are the things that are holding people back. Plus the fact that there's there's too many platforms. We did a short quick. We did this thing, this exercise when we started the Fuse Ben Edgex stuff with a bunch of new partners and customers and feedback and all that. And one of the post-it notes in this design thinking thing was um, uh, develop or, or help me solve the problem of all those customers not doing anything in IT out of the fear of making the wrong choice. That's the market right now. There's too many choices. There's too many solutions looking for problems. We need to focus on value and the value add and not, not you know, reinvention. So, so all these things we're kind of learning together, but, but um, it's, you know, it's interesting. Right. Um, you mentioned two, two things. I mean, one, one was actually they get to sell outcomes, and so ultimately, somehow we have some solutions that meet a business need to a customer. And in some cases, like uh, Sarah, you mentioned with Samsung, your customers are reaching out to you to try to help, to have you help bridge that gap. So I, I see that different perspectives, but we're all dealing with the same problem. The customer has to really understand what is their business outcome, how big is their business outcome, you know, what's the direction they're going long term, and ultimately, they need some help them through the solution. And ultimately, the more massive technology landscape. So in all of these, it sounds like to a degree, you're either being pulled into being a solution partner to some degree, or you're moving towards realizing you need to help that customer with that dialogue for your business to scale and grow. So given that you're all probably talking to the customer in, in certain industries, how do you deal with the fact that the customer is effectively uh, possibly going to multiple people in the ecosystem, almost seeking out this advice and help? You know, And obviously the system integrators are having similar challenges. How do you, how do you see cutting through that? How do you see this moving forward? So, so I, our approach is, is of course, uh, it's a team sport and you have to have a, a stable of partners that you trust and that, that complement your solution and to maintain that, that stable of partners so that when a customer does want to, for example, push us more into services, we have an appropriate partner who can take on that, that task and, and we manage to maintain contact with the customer. So I think you know, all of us are probably taking a similar approach. You, know, you need partners to fill out where, where you're not, uh, where you're not uh, um, servicing the customer. And I think that's uh, that plus having as open a solution as you can. So there are if a customers, we also, finding customers who've already made some decisions, right? They, they, they've already maybe chosen a cloud platform or they've already chosen some aspect of their solution. And so you have to be able to fit in with that too. So it works in both directions. Uh, I would say for <clears throat> Ingram Micro, I think that's one of the reasons why we're really trying to take a solutions approach because I think ultimately, you know, there are so many different business cases out there to solve. There's no way for one company to have enough solutions to solve all of those business cases. So you're always going to end up having custom solutions. But I think one of the things for us is we, with limited resources, we've got to pick and choose where to focus. And so that's why we're trying to build the partnerships. You know, as everyone here is talking about, you need the right partnerships with the right companies that's going to help deliver those solutions. 
Um, I think one of the big things for us as we go into this year and next year is really to help educate the, our VARs and help them educate their end customers so that we can generate that demand. Because right now, you know, aside from the major enterprises, you're, we're not seeing much in, in the way of demand from SMBs coming out uh, and saying, hey, we really want this IoT solution or we want that IoT solution. For the most part, you know, for the, for the SMB customers that understand IoT to an extent, they know that it's quite expensive. Because right now, to get a, you know, a pretty solid IoT solution implemented, you're talking about a lot of money in terms of hardware, you're talking about money in terms of software, your implementation costs on the SI can get very expensive as well. And so I think we're really working on trying to deliver that sweet spot to the customers. And we've really defined that as a couple hundred dollars to maximum a couple thousand dollars per month. Uh, to the customer that you know that can help them solve a business problem. So the way that we feel is, yes, we do get into this ROI discussion a lot, and a lot of the partners that we've talked to have had a very difficult time providing to us concrete ROI figures. And so I think because of that, the way that we want to sell this to the end customer is we want to focus on the solutions that are not that expensive so that for the customer, for them, it's a couple hundred dollars, you know, depending on the size, it's two, three, four, five thousand dollars a month. The benefit itself without calculating the ROI is enough. You know, once we start talking about a deployment that has a you know, hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, million dollar upfront capex cost, along with that recurring cost, plus another fifty to hundred thousand dollars in implementation cost, that's where we're gonna have to prove the ROI. I just want to add or you can... Yeah, I mean, the, the lowering the friction and, and the, the getting things under signature authority for that initial win is always good. You know, whether it's a big company, in that case, you know, it's usually $20,000 or something like that. They would just go, and then it kind of becomes contagious. Or for a small business owner, I totally agree with that kind of having it, the, the risk factor. There's a lot of people that don't believe, oh, just because someone else got that return, but that won't happen for me. Or they're afraid that it will expose dirty laundry that they were that bad to begin with. We see it all the time. Um, uh, there's talk about SME. We had a, a, we've been doing stuff with different you know, businesses of all sizes. There was, there was this fine farmer that's like we were doing this pilot, with, and we offered it up, and, and he's like, I don't need all that stuff. You know, you know, I understand exactly what I need to do with my farm, and, and it just it was a mental thing of like I don't need all this newfangled technology, and like no cost. We put it in there, and a year later, he's like, you couldn't peel his phone away from his fingers. And like, I'm like, this, it, it tells me exactly when to do this and do that or whatever. Like, it's just that leap of faith that it's hard for people, in some cases, at any cost, because of these stigmas. So it's, it's really interesting, just the, the people side of it. It's, it's um, we spent a lot of time looking at that aspect. I mean, there's so many stories that we found that have nothing to do with technology, and that's the hardest part. So. Yeah, and since we're ripping on RFI, our uh, value a little bit in ROI, um, the biggest problem that, that I've actually consistently had, this isn't just an Autodesk thing, is that um, you know, historically I've worked probably 70 or 80% with connected with kind of products versus connected kind of operations or some part of smart agriculture or smart cities. And particularly connected products, like no one wants to talk about what they're doing. So if, if whatever their program was either drove directly X amount of revenue or indirectly Y amount of revenue for, for product attachments that were tied to some service related to IoT, you can never get a case study out of it. So it's maddening whether you're a startup um, who's just trying to put together like value points and case studies and proof stuff, which is what you need to do, or even if you're a large company. Um, you, customers just don't want to talk about what they're doing. Um, and they also, at the same time, don't want to pay anything, you know, because the, the budgets are limited. The yeah, POC so, um, friend zone. Yeah, it's exactly. Like yeah, everybody's, everybody's in the friend zone. It's, it's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, you're eternally there. So that was like a, you know, it's a big, it almost requires, um, you know, a whole new thought process around like, what is our, I actually just talked to someone briefly, like, what is our pricing model should be, you know? And the answer is literally whatever the market will bear, like this month and maybe six months from now, because it's ever evolving. Can I add something to what Ben was saying about, you know, for these SMB customers, you're talking about, you know, a certain, modest amount per month is a reasonable thing. I think another thing that seems to be missing from the market is very clearly priced, low-cost POC options. Uh, so this is something that an engineer in a, in a factory, you know, a maintenance engineer in a factory could rationalize to his or her manager, to the, to the maintenance uh, operations head, um, a small investment for a short-term POC that would show 
um, reasonable ROI, right? And it's got to be a very small investment. And we're really missing solutions, very low cost, short term solutions that would get those POCs going, low investment so the ROI is easier to demonstrate, and then you replicate that solution at a larger scale. That, that seems to be missing from the market today. Yeah, I, I call it the IoT dime bag. Um, we've got to have, like, you just get, get it started. I agree, I mean, but also you have to charge for it. You know, you know we're, we're, we're big companies, you know, there's a lot of you know, big companies, I'm sure, in the room, and it's like everyone expects you to just shower them with MDF, and everybody will kick the tires for free. And, and, and so, so, so heavily subsidized, great. But you gotta, I didn't say free. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, that's what I'm saying. I totally agree with you. Like, you find that sweet spot, but make it kind of a low barrier to entry, and then, and then you know, Brian, as you were saying, like, yeah, uh, people that have competitive damage, I don't like to go on record. I won't give you a case study. If I'm going to heavily subsidize it, you will go on record. You will give me some numbers. You know, so we're starting to kind of play with some of those things. But, but this is the getting people off the dime bag, I guess. I mean, getting people off the dime is, 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 is hard. But you, 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 I think we're doing a disservice, too, with this, this the pre POC thing and some of the, the bigger players out there that have deep pockets have been doing that. And it, it's just a disservice. Maybe something behind the, the startling numbers that Cisco came out with last year about the number of POCs that fail. Basically, 75% of POCs are failing to scale up. And uh, I, I don't know how many of those were free POCs, but I'm, that might be a contributing factor. Yeah, free, but usually when it's free, that means that um, you didn't have exact backing, and that's, a, that's the biggest thing. If someone's next got to be in the line and successful. It just, we've seen numbers, um, if, it's, if it's free, the conversion rate to revenue is about 5%. If you pay for it, the conversion rate's in the mid-double digits usually. Yeah, I mean, the, the implied value of free is zero, right? Yeah. So it can be, yeah, you don't want to give it to free. Uh, but all of us have been in this space in IoT for at least three or four years. So I'm just curious, how would you contrast where we were in 2013, 14 to today? And What's going to enable the major tipping point where you really see business start to scale for your own companies in general? Or are you there? Um, I think from a tipping point standpoint, I feel like, you know, and I can't speak for other companies, but for Ingram Micro, I think we are probably within, I don't know, two years or so from really hitting a tipping point because we really, for, for us, we have to get the right processes and sales motion going and then we have to get enough of a reseller interest before they are out there talking about IoT solutions and finding every opportunity to sell IoT because I think a lot of our resellers, they're, they're focused on you know what they can sell now they're focused on you know, trying to get the rebate numbers, trying to sell a whole bunch of other things. And so IoT, from a revenue standpoint from them, is still relatively small. So I, I mean, I think just like cloud was a couple of years ago, you know, for, at least for, from a distribution standpoint for, for us, selling complete IoT solutions, we're probably still another one or two years off from really uh, getting good traction and, and hitting that tipping point. Selling IoT components, selling sensors and gateways, where are we there? You know, we've got, Hundred million dollar business selling products. Yeah, so um, the, the market's gone from 2012, 2013, machine to machine communications predominantly is what people would talk about. Um, sometimes we talk about smart factory. If you're in buildings, it would be um, you know smart automation or something like that. Um, the smart city barely even existed. Um, definitely, I think well the interest is at least fivefold, and the commercial activity is probably two to threefold. Um, we run a, a professional you know, third-party study every year for the last three years, and we're watching people move up the POC, you know, dime bag ladder as it were, which is, which is thinking about it, doing something to this last one we did in August was 66% of companies have at least one POC underway. This is OEM manufacturers, by the way. Um, have um, an SMB, have a POC underway, and of those, a third are thinking that this could be a commercially deployable thing once they figure the ROI out. Um, so if you take that and then you look at what's happening in the ecosystem, which is that you have at the, um, at the edge layer, you have hardware and software stacks coming together in kind of Lego block fashion. 
you have the middle part, like kind of the thing where C control parts, um, MindScript part, and, and a lot of other parts, other platform parts in the middle, um, kind of doing the analytics. Um, there's probably a missing mobile component out there, but like it's, we're 24 to 36 months away from having plug and play that when you're going to sell it, you can't, it's, it'll be relatively easier to sell than it is today. It's less systems integration. And then that'll intersect with the customer need to think like this is way beyond early adopter now, and if we don't move, we're going to be at a significant disadvantage. And we never want to go first. We definitely want to go, don't want to go last. And I think a lot of companies are thinking, I don't want to go first. I want to be third and then be a fast follower. And I feel like those guys are going to hit in the next, you know, 24 months as well, 24 to 36 months. But there's a lot of technology risk in there. Um, there's there's five companies I'm tracking right now that are making the you know, the, the software that goes on the device, the firmware development problem, which is complicated, and there aren't enough people to solve, like, go away. You know, and that's one of the big frictions outside of the other end of the spectrum, which is management consulting. Yeah, so, so I think if I look at the, the last few years, maybe the last three or four years, in my view, there's been a kind of crystallization of basic use cases. I think if you talk to somebody about IoT three or four years ago, there were hundreds of use cases that were being thrown about. There was a sort of better usage of personnel, there was safety and security use cases, there were process optimization use cases, there were, there were anything and everything was going to be solved by IoT. And then I think when you look at actually what's being implemented today, there's a huge number, at least within the manufacturing smart factory place, space, that's all about just asset monitoring, just knowing what your assets are doing, um, not even predictive, just knowing where they are, what they're doing. And a uh, large portion of, of successful implementations have been around asset monitoring. So, I, and, and some of the more fanciful use cases don't seem to have survived. So this, this crystallization down to a, a few pretty solid use cases has happened in the last couple of years. Right, and we, we even see too, so I definitely agree, like, and we've seen, so it's always start with some basic thing. So we sold tens of thousands of systems into the biggest grocery, I can't name the grocery, but one of the biggest groceries out there, huge, huge deal. Refrigeration monitoring, and it was just that. Is the refrigerator running? How do I know today, open door, insert hand? And, you know, a lot of people were talking about, like, energy management, I can save you power. Well, guess what? The real value, and you were, you were mentioning your food, the real value is the food inside. Oh, but guess what? The real value is your brand. And if someone gets sick from food that wasn't kept at the proper temperature, or someone gets you know, upset because it was you know, bad, it didn't taste good, it kills your brand. That's what you really care about. And so going after kind of, it, it, a lot of times it's not what you immediately think of, but we saw the, the, is the refrigerator running problem. That got everyone excited. The way we did that is that we worked with a partner that knew more about cold chain than anybody. And, but we got, but they brought a white box, and IT's like, hell no, am I going to put that on my network? Oh, well, that was doing it. That's cool. That solved that first problem. And then that customer started doing things like, hey, let me look at predictive maintenance. Let me make it smarter. Let me go look at real time stocking. And it started riffing off of each other. But you start with just this basic thing. And it's not always the thing that you think is the most important. So if, um, if they're starting to crystallize, just want, we see a lot of stuff in, in compliance, <coughs> safety and compliance. Um, Everyone loves to save money, but it's hard when you have 10 business priorities to spend money to save money. But if your name's gonna be in the paper because you just got fined, you know, or something, or someone gets sick, it's a big difference, you know, and so we see a lot there, and then everybody wants the new business models, everybody wants to drive customer experience, um, so a lot of stuff there too, so, uh, but, you know, so it's, it's, it's interesting, but we are seeing some of that, and some of the, the solutions looking for problems kind of fade away. The question, and Ben, you talked about it a little bit because for every one of your companies, my next question about market traction, maybe a little bit of a different answer, right? Because I think, Ben, you talked about, uh, for example, um, gateways, right? You see traction there. Some may talk about traction in terms of certain verticals. So where, where have you seen traction? But where's the real prize with IoT in your estimation? Like, where's the real money to be made because we're here to make money? But where's the value in return, obviously, customers? Maybe those don't quite intersect yet. Yeah, for, for, for the distribution business, um, the margins are typically quite low. And over the last 35 years, we've seen a lot of margin compression, simply selling hardware. 
you know, what used to be a business where we can make 15% margins, now it's oftentimes somewhere between four to eight percent margins, sometimes less depending on the brand. And so because of that, you know, we don't really see uh, the money for us as a distributor really being made in the pure play hardware distribution side. We see it really in the services side. You know, because one of the areas of expertise that we've built up over the last couple of years is around professional services. We've acquired different companies. We have coverage in the US, uh, across Europe. We have coverage in Asia Pacific. So really, we have the coverage to do uh, installations to be the partner when our resellers aren't able to have coverage in that geographic area or have expertise in that particular solution. So really, for us, it's going to be a real service. <coughs> It's selling your data to people you don't know, like I was saying before. It's, it's <coughs> massive scale, and blockchain is, is certainly relevant in my place. I don't need to get blockchain at part time, but too many people talk about blockchain. Um, it's, it's the scale factor is, is monetizing your data with a bill that just goes off into the distance, and someone can just plug it and buy it. That's that's where the you know, new business models, it's, it's you know, revenue things. We see a lot of people that have been disrupted by new things. You know, people are disrupted by Square or Netflix or whatever. Uh, one thing I'm seeing right now, and I've been waiting for this for a little bit, is uh, so three years ago, I'm like, guys, Amazon's going to win the first consumer race. Why? Because they sell you content and they sell you stuff. It's a double whammy. That's the relationship. But what's happening now, it's all about who owns the data. Now, the healthcare providers want to get into the house. But they're like, well, do I get on board with Alexa? If I do that, now that my data's going to be throttled, who owns the house above Amazon? It's the internet providers. So now we're going in with the internet providers, like how do we go and, and drive home health, usage-based insurance, and all that. It's a battle for who owns the data. Um, by doing it in the kind of as open a fashion as possible, now you're able to cross between public and public, private and private, break these silos. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of where the data is going. And then of course there's privacy rights and GDPR and all that. You have to invest in this. I think that the battleground for the, you know, after we get past some of this fragmentation for the next five years is who owns the, who owns the data. And the, the holy grail is that it's just kind of ubiquitous and you can sell it to anybody. But, um, but that's, that's the biggest battleground we see right now is, is the, 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 the own, I want to own the customer. Uh, we've gotten past the stage where everyone believes that they're going to do it all on their own technology wise. Um, but, but now it's who owns the customer. And it's, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think new business models around outcome-based services. So I actually got pulled into this business by the DOD, who for years, they don't, you know, actually would prefer not to sell you an aircraft carrier. They'd love to just sell you, like, rent it to you. And then they'll provide all the maintenance when it comes to your court. They already do that for Humvees and a bunch of other things. So, um, like, a few things in the world, like the, D, you know, defense spending has actually created some innovation there. Um, Siemens actually does a lot of, um, performance-based contracts for managing you know, factories and buildings and lots of things. And so I think that concept of like, I don't own the car, you know, I get a, I get a ride with it with an operator, I rent, I rent it for you know, 25 minutes to an hour or three hours, you know, before you take your Uber or your Waymo or whatever. Um, that needs to percolate through IoT and then so that everything's just hidden, it's like one simple transaction because at some point in the race for everyone to become a service provider, you can't have like 3,000 subscriptions or 25 like monthly things um because when that happens then everything will tip back to like capital spending you know so there's there's sort of this um i don't say tipping point but there's sort of cataclysm cataclysmic thing happening out there in the distance where um there's there's new business models meeting people's tire tiresome um weariness around having a subscription to everything whether they're subscribing to hardware whether they're subscribing to actual software um, but i do think outcome based scenarios is where everything's heading because people just want to buy ROI anymore. They want to buy the experience. Which, which is why I, I totally agree. And in the consumer space, the pockets will be around your Amazons and your Googles and all that because that's my main relationship. So then I can aggregate, I can be comfortable aggregating services around those centers of gravity. In the business world, you can't have a single provider own everything. You have to do it through open, open uh, frameworks. It's the only way it works. Then with those open frameworks, <coughs> like, truly open, like, based in open source community kind of stuff. It's a little bit worse. Then you start to build these things around it. And then there's the battle of phones and data, but eventually then those open frameworks allow you to get these services through more consolidated means. And then it's palatable to have you know, all these different things as a service. But it, it is about outcome. You know, power by the hour, comfort as a service. I don't sell HVAC, I sell comfort. That's where it's headed. But you, you've got to break apart these silos of data and who owns the data. You know, there's a lot to it. I won't go into all the details. These are the things that we look at because that's how it's going to scale out. I totally agree with you. Know, 
was saying. With a lot of money. Yeah. So somebody who provided a managed service with a lot of money. Yes. Yes. So, Sarah, yeah, I would agree very much with the data. I think the data is where the, the data is the is the new oil. Um, uh, just one very specific market that I think is, is interesting um, on the manufacturing side. It's all about just in time manufacturing. It's all about um, uh, lots of one, so very small lots of, of customized products, and and really that means that the oil supply chain also has to be just in time. And I think there's a big opportunity. Um, uh, there's a lot of inefficiencies in the supply chain, and knowing what that supply chain is doing at all points in real time is is really, I think, a big opportunity. So somebody who can crack that, or a group of people who can really crack that, I think there's a lot of um, inefficiency that can be um, removed, and hence hence a lot of money to be made. And uh, I think Ben, you had some statistics about um, uh, your your mega trend, and uh, you know online activity and uh, you know that's all feeding into again more more requirement for real-time uh, deliveries and uh, logistics I've, I've had more more conversations the past three months about connected workers and wearables and the biggest variability in businesses is people uh, we use the power for good not evil we can create good brothers so much you know, it's, it's kind of interesting we have a lot of people big big companies like mining companies My problem is people, moving assets and all that kind of stuff, logistics, and supply chain, visibility, and that's a hard. Too many people from my world draw these monster technology diagrams, data lakes, and all this stuff, and they put sensors and gateways at the bottom. But that's the hard, there's these little pops at the bottom, that's the hardest part is getting data, good machine data from the physical world. So it's an interesting way. Yeah. As you, and, and, and the classic picture of an IoT is sort of an IoT diagram. It kind of looks like a triangle with a whole bunch of, of things on the bottom, and then it's all feeding up to some all-knowing cloud at the top. But the key thing is actually you've got to get the all-knowing cloud, the information from the cloud, down to real people so they can make decisions. So you're right, wearables is a huge thing. Um, I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger. But it's pushing that, that information right down to the people who need it. And sometimes that's forgotten in these solutions. OK, well, then we'll take uh, some questions from the audience. I know there's. Hi, my name is Yogi Sikri. I, I run a billion dollar business for TXC technology services business for IoT and mobility. Great, great conversation. Uh, I, I heard a couple things. One was around, you know, the 400 plus platforms out there. And, and I see it all the time, you know, building customers. The second is around uh, use cases. And so I took, and, and actually the third related to that is around open source and, and connectivity between different platforms. So today what I see is, you know, the way that a typical customer, let's say, you know, oil and gas customer, the way they solve um, interconnectivity is by is by mitigating, you know, basically what I call as vendor lockdowns. They essentially try to say, fine, you know, if you're gonna give me a particular platform, I will see that, you know, the data itself is sitting in a separate system so I can play with the data. And the, you know, the platform that, that does the processing is a different system to maybe you know, like, a, like a modeling tool is a different system. So you can essentially still build that overall solution. And, and now if you need to, you know, let's say one of the platform is, is not doing well, then you can just rip and replace that easily. That's what they're solving that, right? So you, know, you, you still are able to get this, this uh, system talking to each other. And, and so I have a two-part question. One is, in my experience, what is happening is that customers really look to um, get the right system for their problem. And if you've seen that trend as well. And so my my at least observation is that you know maybe they you know the, the 400 plus platforms will come down to like 20 or 30 or 40, and and they would be more based on use cases and or industry. And, and from a customer standpoint, you know, then it's like they get the best solution for the right problem. Do you see the same kind of trend happening over time? And uh, also from a use case perspective, you know, I see kind of two things. Adoption, either, either companies that have legacy systems and they want to basically you know, do something new, 
they are transitioning to uh, IoT based you know framework for that, or customers that are completely you know changing their business models, they're basically adopting that. Are there other use cases that you see for for you know like mainstream adoption? I think that we will end up with a handful of flavors of cake and lots of icing and sprinkles. Um, I don't think that you know, we need a bunch of vertical platforms. I think that you can actually solve a lot of these problems with horizontally scalable, loosely coupled, you know, you plug and play. I mean, I totally agree, like you want to be able to directly replace, not be locked in. The battle over who owns the data is why people, especially the big clouds, they're guilty of this for sure right now, is trying to lock people into their platforms. Um, it's gonna be a little time before that gets worked out, but we don't need all these platforms. You know, I, I think it's more like there's gonna be, you know, five years from now, there'll be under 10 really successful, horizontally, massively scalable platforms, and then a lot of domain knowledge applied, and a lot of pure play ingredients, really good plug-in security, really good plug-in analytics of the you know, XYZ kind. That's where I think the market's going to be. I don't think it's going to be. You'll see some very specific vertical focus or use case specific. Maybe it's around you know, video analytics or certain types of things where you just can't do it with the common guts. But there's no reason technically why you don't do it. You know, different things around real time needs and all that, bells and whistles. But um, it's going to be a process to kind of reduce it. But it, it, we don't need all of it short of who wants the data. I, I mean, Yeah, I, I totally agree. So uh, I've been around like thing management for a long time, whether it's called asset optimization, optimization or something else. And from a technical person's perspective, there is almost no difference between an agricultural application and monitoring a truck. There might, there's a, there's a heavier um, push on if you're monitoring a truck on the amount of data that comes from it because it's a big engine and who's running a map and some other stuff. But the, but the, the thing itself and the time series data associated with it are like identical. And then typically the business logic it's just really not that different, right? Like, so um, there's a person associated with one, like, driving a truck, and then there's a person associated with going a field and checking on it. It's an operator. And so um, th there's been enough work done to this point where there's enough um, platforms out in the market, there's just distillation going on, and then the big tech vendors will offer all the common things for free. Because um, from a stack perspective, there's only 10% variance, and then that 10% variance will get picked up by vertical players who will sell in niches that just don't know any better. And, um, and this, it'll be just like the internet. And so when you know when dot com days were going on, there were there was people starting to go. Anybody in this audience heard of Broadvision? So Broadvision was like the first personalization server before it became a built-in function to every free open source application server on the planet. So that one-click ordering on Amazon, that kind of capability. What, what did you buy before? Let's buy it. You know, let's buy it again. That used to be a specific niche product because. More retailers didn't know any better. They're like, let's go to this company that talks my language about personalized commerce. And so, the the the, the niche verticalization is a business strategy and not a technical strategy. So I think that yeah, loosely coupled, open, which will be the big thing. This is a lock-in business. So when your devices are out there in the field, you know you don't want them locked in. And even at the cloud level, that's still a real problem. Like if you put up in AWS, like how do you move it to Google Cloud or SoftLayer or somebody else? And there's now there's just now. 10 years after AWS came in, onto the scene, like technology to move from, from place to place. Now that'll come into the market probably too. Like how do I move my devices from vendor A to vendor B, whether it's hardware or software. But I think there's just, there's always a natural drive towards consolidation. So, I, I would just add, so to, a lot of people are confused. So I mean, I'm, I harp on NGX a lot because we think it's important for the market, but open source doesn't mean free. You know, someone has to support it, but also, that project and the, all the companies that are getting involved in it, you could re replace every lick of code in, in, the, in that code base and still be compliant by following these basic APIs that just say, this is how you interoperate with other people. And that's why we think that this use case thing is possible, but you know, the horizontal technology is like, you, you decouple the things in the application so that it, it solves that thing where you're not locked in. But also, um, there are already people in that community writing C-based variants that would run on the PLC. So now all of a sudden I'm serving a special need, but I can still interoperate with other people because I follow the APIs for northbound applications or southbound you know, sensors and actuators and all that. There's ways to do it, but you want to also to want to be open. We want to don't want to step on toes for commercial value items. So, so as a community, you know, we've been very careful about doing that. And 
that, that loosely coupled, you know, API-driven thing, get a bunch of people in, in, in together to solve just the basics, just enough to work together better, and then be as proprietary as you want. That's how that scales out, and, and you get to more of the, the, the icing and sprinkles around the same cake. So, yeah. one, one more question. Hi, I'm curious to understand. Okay, by the way, my name is VS, VS Joshi. I am consulting with Hitachi Ventura. I'm curious to understand as to whom are you targeting exactly in the customer environment? You come from the IT side. Are IT people even the right people to focus on? Okay, and then, okay, if that is the case, then what exactly is the leverage that a company like Dell or, a, or an IT company has, number one? And number two is from the Siemens side, I, I'm guessing you are focusing on the OT side of the house. Or or is there a new set of new set of functions and new set of people emerging in the customer environment that need to be targeted? They have to get past IT in many cases. You can't be scaling this out of shadow IT. So we're working with people that get into those areas now. We're getting more and more meetings with the LBs, but we also have a lot of IT meetings. This is a typical meeting with an IT person. Tell me the magical use case and the ROI associated with it that I can bring into the operations group and look relevant to them. I get it all the time. I was talking to CIOs of those major companies out there, and that's what they want to know. But 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 we're seeing this change now where the CEO is telling IT, this is now your job. And then they're making their inroads with other people, and so that path, that is a viable path, but normally you have to go to the OT or the law. So it's, it's, it's interesting, but that's why we're also partner. Um, yeah, just quick on, and so I've always sold SaaS for like over 20 years, software as a service. I avoid IT like the plague, so I'm always looking for, um, I'm serious, like, I mean, you, you, your whole value proposition is, yeah, you, it's, yeah, I'm gonna sell you something for $500 a month, it's almost, um, so inexpensive that it can go on any someone's credit card. So it's one of the reasons I agreed to be acquired by Autodesk versus some other companies we were talking to is that they their, their customer is a non-IT user. And it, it's, it seems, and it is actually, it's going to manifest itself as a better way to infiltrate this longer game for what we were focused on, which is kind of problems. Yeah, just a slightly different interpretation of your question, but I think um, an IoT sale is a complex sale, and it's at many levels in the organization, it's at many functions in the organization. Um, it's IT, OT, it's finance, it's, um, uh, and then the line of business itself, and, and you have to make the case to, to all of those. So, uh, we haven't found a way to simplify that. If anyone has some ideas, we'd love to hear them. Okay, one more question, since uh, we're keeping people long, so. Ready to first? Thanks. Uh, Phil uh, Ted Spin. I have a question. So you are talking about that actually the business is a one to target. Um, the question I have is, since we are now uh, experiencing that like consumer applications like the watches are so packaged, uh, isn't it like that now the business comes and says, hey, I want everything out of the box and like just go to my app and it's working? Is that like the thing or? Because currently it's still we, we talk about other things. Yeah. So, so I mean, basically you're asking like, are are people looking for sort of fully packaged solutions? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, well, that's where Ingram I think right. a lot of stuff. Yeah, I I think um, you know in, in in our view we have to really break down the the customer, and this goes to the prior question. Because you know, there's no one solution fits all in terms of how you sell to a customer, uh, how you approach a customer. Because we have to segment uh, at least our in customers through our resellers by vertical, and then beyond that, we have to differentiate it by size of the customer. So we have to look at it from you know companies that are essentially 25 to 500, 500 to 1,000, and 1,000 and up, and then we have to divide it by vertical. So you know, to touch on the previous question. Um, if we're selling towards healthcare, depending on the type of solution, we would target a certain person within healthcare. If we're selling to a bank, depending on, again, depending on the type of solution, to manufacturing, it depends on the solution. Now, to answer your question, 
um, there are some solutions which can be packaged uh, in a box that doesn't require additional, you know, a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, configuration, and it doesn't require a lot of development work. Those are the solutions that we're doing right now. We are onboarding those solutions with vendors that we found, and we will be reaching out to uh, very small uh, companies. But those solutions have a very very like specific use case. It's very narrow, and for a lot of companies, it doesn't solve all the problems. What's the package solution you can sell today? Uh, Market solution. Well, so one of the solutions that we sell today is a company called Buddy. Um, so it's a Seattle-based company, and they do essentially utility monitoring, energy monitoring. All right, well, I think I should let the esteemed panelists uh, go and then thank them. Thanks, Sarah, Brian, Ben, and Jason. Thank you. Um, I think we can spend all night talking about this, but I'd rather do it over a few beers. Okay. Okay. Like, uh, job at Siemens, uh, go ask Yeah. <laughs> right. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thanks to the panel, and I'll hand it back to uh, Brian. Thank you, Brian. We're doing, we're doing, we're doing. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for all the guys for coming. Like, I mean, this is their day job. They came here over their own, their own time. So thanks everybody.